Nigel, this is so good. I feel like I've <laughs> le leapt. I've <laughs> leapt and full. There's so many questions you're asked to, you know, to join Zoom. And, and you know, I yeah. don't know. I, somehow I hit the right ones this time. Uh, well, it's brilliant. And it's a familiar face because you've met me before because we had a bit of a chat in home for it, didn't we? I seem to remember I was banging on about scarves and things like that. And I oh, think no, you were maybe, so what it is, I don't drink before a gig, but there's sometimes yeah. half the gig I make up for it. And I, I think you were having a gin and tonic or something. Oh my God, I was drinking it like lemonade, you know? <laughs> so yeah, but you deserved it. It was a cracking gig. Everybody enjoyed it. Oh, thank it. you. Yeah, now, listen, I have to say, Nigel, this is the best lineup. I mean, I shouldn't really say that, but it's yeah. the most comfortable lineup in the blockheads i've ever known it's just oh, that's like fabulous everybody gets on so well you know? yeah 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 they, they did well i mean nathan king was his bass solo was just incredible wasn't it so punchy and on, on the button just great he's a phenomenal musician yeah well i love it when you get people like that you know who whose brothers might be acclaimed but then meanwhile yeah. in the shadows often it's difficult i think for a musician like that you know mark king being you know, absolutely well known as he is, yeah. But uh, Nathan is gracious, he's a lovely, lovely man. You know, he's yeah. so humble, he's funny. You couldn't wish for a, a more evolved human being in the band, really. Yeah, it's, it was really, really entertaining. I absolutely loved it. And we came over the top because we live in South Manchester, so we came over the top in all the thick fog. And then we left in the thick fog as well. <laughs> so it was like it was oh. a bit of a bit of a trauma getting home. I can tell you. <laughs> oh, we well, well like... done, well done. You made it. Yeah. Thanks for joining me today. This is Thank Chaz you. Jankel from the Blockheads um, and many other endeavours over the years, which we'll cover. Um, and uh, you're talking to Nigel from Loud and the Wall. So thank you very much for joining me today, Chaz. It's a pleasure, um, Nigel. Yeah, if we can just take it all the way back to the beginning and your love of Lonnie Donegan, um, <laughs> <laughs> who well, actually, Lonnie. he went to school not sort of five, six miles away from here at St Ambrose College in Hale Barnes. So he's a bit of a sort of celebrity in, in my area here, yeah. old Lonnie Donegan. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of your first um, influence, I guess, wasn't it? I Skip suppose it was really, but it was more visual. I just seem to remember him standing there with a bit of wood that was horizontal to his body. <laughs> yes. And I thought, what's that? And he seemed to be smiling a lot. And I thought, well, that looks good because most ad adults don't seem to smile that I he see. He did, didn't he? Yeah. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll give that a go. I was, yeah. I was only seven and uh, I sort of harangued, well, harassed my parents. Well, asked them. I don't think you harass at seven years old. I uh, basically said, you know, can you can you get me a guitar, please? <laughs> so I did. I got one for my birthday. Uh, so it, three, yeah, it's an it's not so much of an awakening at seven years old. It's just like the earliest thing you can remember. I think the earliest thing I ever remember was sitting around the radio and listening to Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. You know, so wow. <laughs> it's very much like a marker in time as opposed to something yeah. that set you on your way. Yeah, my music. Um, yeah, it, it sort of transcends time in a way, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Music, you know, because it's quite amorphous. But yeah, um, yeah so that, that was my first um, memory. Uh, well, that was what got me going, let's put it like that. And then Cliff Richard and the Shadows. <laughs> were, you, were, you, were you sort of going out with your mum and buying records at that point? Or is that a little bit too early? <laughs> oh, I think it was a days of, of you know, that the... the, the um, record player that you know what you know that a uh, decker that you know you open the top up and there's a you know one spindle like the dance set that's it and you yeah. pop your 45s yeah. on it and and one yeah. by one they they sort of like descend onto the uh turntable right. you know you studied um uh, the guitar and the piano and it's quite unusual that a child gets into both of those instruments so close to each other you know normally somebody picks up a guitar they find they have they're proficient at the guitar and they spend all their time getting really good at it but you studied the guitar or studied or learned the guitar and the piano and, and that's quite mm. unusual isn't it maybe it is i don't know mm. i mean did miles davis have a second inst instrument or i don't know mm. i mean hmm and, you know, I obviously loved music and yeah. um, my, my brother, the thing was my, the, my parents rented a piano for my brother and he was two years older than me and he, he showed very little interest in it. And I think I reached up because I wasn't very tall and I, I hit a, a couple of notes, went plink, plink, plink. Yeah. And um, they thought, oh, you know, maybe. So they, um, 
I can't remember whether they rented a piano or they bought a piano. Um, but then I, I did have lessons as I did with on guitar as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, and once again, life progressed from there, yeah. but, um, I was terribly unacademic and, um, um, I learned mainly by teaching myself, you know, by ear. Yeah. Um, I got to grade two on piano um, and I had lessons on guitar. Um, but really, just like so many other musicians born at my time, and I was born in 1952. Yeah. So in my era, a lot of musicians were learning by ear because yeah. the music they were hearing on the radio was so free and more advanced than you know, the kind of classical rep, um, studies, which I, you know, I equated with Victorian England, you know, yes. <laughs> you know all black and white and sort of no yeah. great colour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting, though, because obviously I saw you at home for, uh, with the Blockheads and you were going back to the keyboard and then standing up and playing guitar. It's quite unusual to see somebody... <laughs> you know, multi-instrumentalist on stage flicking between the I two know. Like that, you know? It used to be a real dilemma for me, you know, how are people going to, you know, am I a jack? Am I jack of all trades? You know, what 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 is going on here? But, yeah, you know, we all have a path to take and we, we seem to have to take that path. I mean, yeah, mind you, I saw what I see the other day, some sort of Zen saying, I can't remember if it was a Zen saying or something like that, you know, the man that has two, um, um, what do you call them? Um, bullseyes, or right? two, two, two targets. targets never, yeah. never hit, doesn't hit either one. You know. <laughs> so I thought, oh, is that me? You know. Yeah. Well, but, I've um, I've thought that too. You know, the jack of all trades argument. But I think you know it's accepted that if both of those trades are actually in the music business and they both involve an instrument, I think that's fairly okay. You that's know. True. You, 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 Chris, you, Chris Martin gets away with it, doesn't he? You know. He, he's yeah. Sort of, no, absolutely. And and John Lydon paints and. Um, um, Captain Beefheart was a great painter. You know, it seems like yeah. the art is in somebody. It can yeah. actually sort of be transposed to other forms of art as well. But well, uh, I love art. I mean, I'm, I mean, when I left school, I went to St. Martin's and I picked it up of late. But I have to say my, my downfall is I'm using felt tips. Well, maybe the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York might say, hey, it's quite, you know, quirky. <laughs> but I certainly don't think it would be hanging in the, the Royal Academy. Let me get my felt tips out. I'm sure David Hockman has used felt tips yeah, in his time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did you realise that you had a talent for writing a melody? Because for me, the ability to write a melody is almost God given. If you, if you, you know, listen to interviews with Paul McCartney and people like mm. that, maybe even John Lennon, Bob Dylan, how and why did you get the right to have those melodies dropped on you? That you mm. have the God given ability, or whatever you call it to write a melody because it's incredibly difficult and it's almost like it happens by magic mm. there's two routes really i mean yeah. one is if you're you know you're just sitting on your own on a guitar with a guitar or you're sitting at the piano yeah um and there's no other script there's nothing you nothing prescribed there's no prescription at this point yeah. um if you just let your mind just be free just like the, you know, you could say like nature is, it's free, you know, like, a, then if you, it, it just kind of flow, it floats in. You well, know? this is what I'm saying. Um, it's almost unnatural, isn't it? Supernatural. I listen, Nigel, if I said to you, sing what's ever in your head right now, yeah. you would sing something. There is something in there. there for some something. people, for some people, for some people, and I'm, I have a, uh, music going through my head all the time i wake right. up with a tune in my head i go to sleep with a tune in my head yeah. i have to exercise it occasionally and play it on spotify just to get it out of my head because yeah. comfortably months comfortably numbs come in and it won't go away yeah. so i get that but i definitely know that a lot of people just don't have that mm. that some people don't have that music throwing flowing through the, their brains and if you said sing what's in your head they'd go what <laughs> so I I'll think tell you a funny story. I, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Right. So, because um, you know, obviously, I wrote. I've written a lot of songs with lyricists and writers. And, yes. and when I wrote with Ian, yeah. for example, we'd done you know, written "Sex and Drugs" and "Rock and Roll" and a lot of songs, and yeah. that appeared on "New Boots and Panties." Yeah. But when we got to the end of that album, we, we you know, 
we didn't have much else uh, to write uh, to, to you know to record. Well, you'd have the years building up to that, hadn't you? To, we had the years know. building up, and that was yeah. you know that's why it was such a phenomenal album yeah, because Ian, Ian had all his yeah. life to reference, you know, yeah, and he had a lot to talk about. But yeah. when it got to the second album, Do It Yourself, yeah. we didn't have anything. But I'd been working on a melody outside of Ian. You know, like I'd been going um, to another studio, working on this piece, which was eventually become In Between Is, yeah. which was the opening track for Do It Yourself. Bam, yeah. bam, bam, bam. Now, the thing was, um, the whole thing was built for not, well, quite interesting, around the bass line. It yeah. was actually the bass line that became the melody. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, and technically what happens is you get one bum 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 dun 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 and everything else I'd ever written with Ian had always started on the first beat, like skinny yeah. white sailor, the chances were slender, the beauty, you know, yeah. and so on yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Sex and drugs. It was always a very definite one. You come yes. up and here's yeah. me presenting but in the mirror, you know, it's <laughs> definitely not on the one. And yeah. um I mean, yeah. I remember when he heard it, he was shocked and he said to me, Here, Chaz, what am I? A bit of furniture in the room. Because <laughs> he had to wait to come in, you mean? Is that exactly? <laughs> and I think he was stumped for a bit, you know. Um, yeah. He had to scratch his head, but then he came up with a genius lyric, you know. But you said so, that um, the, the, the song, the in between, is the melody was in the bass line, but isn't that the case with sex and drugs and rock and roll? And you know yeah dum, dum, yeah. dum, 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 dum. it was all in that funky bass line yeah which... there, there's a lot of that yeah um what what do i say to that you know i mean i i might i could fast forward here and and um i think it, you know many well it must have been much much later in my writing relationship with ian yeah and one day i was sitting around his flat you know, we'd probably been writing and hanging Is this at the Oval? At the Oval. Uh, no, I think at this point, it was later on in his life, it was either in a flat in Hampstead that he bought for his mum. Yeah. Or it was at Hammersmith, Hammersmith, where he had a flat overlooking the Thames. And one day he says to me, Chaz, do you know what I, how I see rhythm or how I feel rhythm? And I went, no. How, what was that in? And he said, did you ever see the movies Zulu? Did you see the film Zulu? And I went, yeah. He said, well, you remember when Michael Caine was, um, you know, was he was he was he was in a bit of a tight spot because, like, he was on one side of a hill and there was the Zulu Nation on the other. Yeah. Right? And yeah. all he could hear from his side was this, hum, 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 hum. And he said yeah. that was the sound of you know, like thousands of Zulus all beating their shields in yeah. unison. He yeah. said, that's rhythm to me. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that marvellous? Yeah, the thrum, think, thrum of it. Yeah, it was defiance. It was defiance. Yeah. And yeah. it was that defiance that Ian needed to get keep him going forward because um, life was a struggle. Yeah. You know, he, he'd contracted polio. Um, and so walking around was difficult and even more difficult going upstairs. And in those, you know, in the 70s yeah. and 80s, there weren't the the facilities for disabled people. Absolutely like there not, especially in the tower blocks. And... I've got a friend called Chris Hewitt. I don't know if you know him. He yeah. runs an audio company near here. He rents out um, vintage audio equipment, Pink Floyd's rigs from 1973 and, and the Pompeii stuff and all that sort of stuff he's got. Mm. And he was a roadie for Ian. And he tells me how he used to carry Ian up the stairs, <laughs> uh, you know, the flat at the Oval overlooking the cricket ground. Did he? I, Did he? I said, why, he? why was he living there? We love the cricket. He said he used to oh. help carry him upstairs, yeah. Did you know yeah. the cricket? I reckon, I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe he did. I don't seem to ever remember looking out, watching a game of cricket. But, oh, really? You know, um, well, that's the story I've been given. Maybe, so, maybe, uh, maybe he did. He had, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, things I didn't, I found out later about Ian. <laughs> I didn't but know. You, you came together from different musical backgrounds and Ian was into Gene Vincent, Chuck Berry, old rock and roll. Um, well, rock and roll, nascent rock and roll. And you came from a completely different angle because you were into Sly Stone and, you know, later yeah. on, I guess, Rose Royce and Earth, Wind and Fire and that sort of hmm. thing. How the hell did that come together? Because normally when you form a band, it's two hmm. mates at school, you're both into the Sex Pistols hmm. and you can't play your instruments very well. And yeah. you go, right, let's do it. You know, but yeah. you came from completely different directions. And well, I'm really yeah. interested how that, how that, yeah. joke, how that came together. Well, Nigel 
we have to remember, and I have to remember, and I had to remember then that I came, you know, I was living in North London, Stanmore, you know, I'm yeah. like, you know, even though Ian was living in the Oval, I wasn't living in LA. I wasn't, you know, from Compton. I wasn't that. You know, the black dude, I, I in, in my... In straight out of Compton, straight, straight out of Stanmore. Straight out of Stanmore. I like that. I like that. Maybe that's the title of the autobiography that I, yes. I never liked. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did that work? Well, how did it go listen, I, as you said earlier, my, my primary influences were the Beatles. Yeah. Um, um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm in Cliff Richard and the, and the Shadows, you know, the Beatles. And then when I was 14, I heard Lee Dorsey. That led me into yeah. soul music, really. Yeah. Get Out yeah. My Life, Woman. That was the B side of working down a coal mine. Right. And that was it. I mean, really what I was connecting with, with uh, was the rhythm. Yeah. And then when it got to, um, you, you know, so the Beatles, I would say, were predominantly melodically based. Yeah, yeah. they had rhythm. But yeah. they never really, it didn't make you want to kind of wriggle big time. It, it kind of made you want to kind of, it was more, more straight direct, out, wasn't it? Raw. It was, it was quite, quite raw. Yeah. Well, up until when George Martin appeared, then it got a lot more yeah. psychedelic yeah. and sort mm -hmm. of like, well, just sophisticated. sophisticated. Yeah. 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 Um, but I still like bands like The Who, Free, um, yeah. Small Faces, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Um, I was really into uh, um, um, Albert King. I was, you know, I was really loved that raw edge. And even today, I mean, yeah. I play more. My guitar playing is more bluesy, and um, than I would say jazz. Yeah, you know, I have, you know, um, it's more. Or, although I, I can, you know, I can winch it up and play kind of more punk, which I, I think that was always part of Ian. So even though I brought funk to the band, yeah. to yeah. Ian, there was also a lot of um, angst that didn't sit neatly with funk rhythms. Yeah. And I would just, you know, get down to three chords and play them as loudly as I could. You know? <laughs> Particularly on block heads, I guess. I mean, that's exactly, like, exactly. You know, so there was all track. that. Yeah. And back in the day when we first started, I didn't know any other bands that were, you know, like hopping from one genre to the next there wasn't any other band at the time and i think what you mm. managed to do mm. is that you got that strange juxtaposition which created those clashes within the musical structure which created the magic behind new boots and panties i guess through all the songwriting and the the different cultures between you and ian you actually mm. got a nation of young punks to listen to disco and funk music. That's basically exactly. what happened. You're and we all went right. round singing sex and drums and rock and roll. And it was just da dancing disco, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I suppose so. But you know, the funny thing was that also on top of that, Ian introduced people to jazz. People yes. like that, to jazz. Yeah. Which is yeah. they probably never thought they'd, oh, you know, well, they were probably a bit sniffy about jazz. Yeah. Um, and, but Ian, um, open the door for a lot of people. Well, you did too. There's a lot of jazzy yeah. elements that have followed yeah. you through your well, career, through the I Know Carida and into yeah. Flow. The, the there is a yeah. yeah. There's a lot of well, sort of jazzy elements in there, fusion type stuff, yeah. It, yeah, Ian, um, you know, I, so I have a lot of other influences we didn't talk about. Uh, yeah, obviously there's a mm. the kind of funky side and, and you know, and, and then the rocky, other you know, side I was just describing, but also I love romantic classical music. And what I mean by that is the era, romantic, the era. Uh, yes. and, and, you know, and I, because I play piano as well, I've always loved, um, to be honest, the slower pieces, the adagios, the kind of the middle pieces of a symphony, not yeah. the kind of, you know, um, the fast pieces, mm -hmm. which I also, you know, there might be occasional sort of up-tempo piece I like, but... No, nah, I, I like the adagios, the very sort of heartfelt, like, for example, you know, or Mozart's clarinet concerto or, or the middle movement of Brooks' um, violin concerto. Yeah. I mean, you've really got know, one on me there because I'm not that familiar with classical no, music. I love Debussy. I love Holst the Planets. And I think Debussy well, is too. wonderful. Yeah. Me too. I love all that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just love the serenity of it and the kind of... Yeah. The um, the articulation, how how concise and well, you know how it is on a beautiful summer's day, on a beautiful day, 
which is you today, it's beautiful in Sunday. Isn't yeah. it beautiful? Yeah. So I equate longer notes, you know, like longer sounds than, yeah. than, than I would do. Absolutely. No, no, slow down. Yeah. yeah. And you have, uh, it's sort yeah. of somehow floats on the wind but that, doesn't that define a sort of west coast sound as well because it's all sunny and glorious and you know yeah. you have america a horse country. with no name and all that yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Actually, they were english but, yeah. i don't know i used to worry that ian thought i was you know maybe i was teetering on on, on bland but i i don't think so i mean you know if ever right. he thought something was teetering that way um I, I, I would sniff it. I would. I would be aware of that, and I'd rein it back in. But, yeah. Um, Stick some punch back into it. Exactly. But yeah. you know, like I think Ian also realised you needed a mixed menu. You can't just have an album full of blackmail man, or you know, yeah. that was something that he'd. But build you can because the damned did well. You with could. you know the first album. Um, you could do. But and the pistols know, did. It was one genre, very specific. That's true. Almost one. Great um yeah oh, you're absolutely well, right all it, the way through. well you're absolutely right and i yeah. and, and you make yeah you're glad you picked me up on that however yeah. with ian he was called the godfather of punk but he wasn't he was far broader you know he was an art yeah. student yeah and art students and you know like um you know that the, they they like to hear jazz yeah he was 10 years older than me now if ian was alive now he'd be 81 yes and they yes. they referenced music like um you know that it was coming from the states which was kind of renegade rene and it, that was renegade music yeah for them how do you um, what and, how do you define renegade music you mean like protest? well it was well, it was like for a start it was re recorded mainly in by black musicians right right um and they were really on you know they they were the disenfranchised part the disenfranchised of america yeah yeah. So um, they were, you know, weren't treated equally like Ian wasn't yeah. um, because of his yeah. disability. So there were a lot of parallels for Ian. Do you think Ian fe felt an affinity because of his, um, his, I think his affliction? So. I, think, yeah. I, I do think so. And he I was think very awkward on stage, wasn't he? And, and I wasn't really that aware of it. It was only when you saw him kind of walking around or I know it sounds stupid, but watching Andy Serkis perform him in the autobiography you know the yeah. film and Andy did a fantastic job I thought that yeah. was amazing but he really highlighted the difficulties that Ian had that maybe we weren't aware of as just fans you know because you saw him in a video and he'd stand awkwardly but wouldn't really move away from the mic you know yeah. when you saw the the, the the nature of the disability then it really hammered home how how challenging that that was it so was. I, yeah so Ian yeah. felt disenfranchised and difficult and uh, maybe discriminated against but Mike, Mike's a kind of, um, he's quite athletic, Mike, actually, at the end of the day. You know, he, he used yeah. to play football and and um, he's a totally different character. But, you know, yeah. that's what, you know, from Ian or Derek, they're, very, they're all very different. They all have, they've all definitely had their own personalities and that's, yeah. that's come across in all, the, obviously, the, the different performances. I think what I like about both Derek and Mike is that they, they never try to be Ian. No, it's not about being Ian. It's just about no. performing the songs. In Mike's case, the love is uh, love of music hall, the affinity there, you know, that type of thing. So it's quite it's nice to see, to to, to be honest. Um, just yeah. moving forward, then um, mm. you moved into after well during that heat after the blockheads, you moved into a more sort of jazz funk groove with the first album, and that ran all the way through, and it actually. There's a thread all the way through to this album flow, isn't there? There's that. Oh, you talking about my own my own album? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's very intuitive with me, Nigel. I just sort of, um, I suppose, if I've written something that's quite funky, then the next thing I want to do is not write something like that. It's going to be <laughs> kind of quite. Maybe it might just be a solo piano piece, and then maybe yeah. having from that, I'll hop onto something else. You know, like you know. You often hear about kind of gurus and sort of like sort of um, healers and a lot of people. There's a big emphasis on living now in the now. Yeah, Don't live moment. yesterday, tomorrow. Well, I've been doing that all my life. Yeah. I mean, that's all I really know. In fact, it doesn't always, it's not always the best route to take because 
Yeah. You know, people... it's good if you can do that and you don't have the future to worry about so much and you can yeah. live in the now. I think there are mm. far too many people who are sort of worried about their, you know, existentialism, <laughs> their, their future. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult, isn't it? It's it, difficult it, to it live is, in the it, now. It is difficult. However, it, it, you know, it can be difficult for other people around you. Yeah. Because then they can't plan anything. Yeah, because <laughs> you don't know. You know, like you're so busy living now that you, you know, you, the notion of um, the future is, it's or living or planning ahead is difficult. Mm, mm. But um, I'm, am I different from where I was when I was younger? Slightly less physical energy. The knees are getting a bit, you know, a little bit more. We're not, we're not worn out, but you know, I can yeah. tell when I go down the stairs, they're not quite as stable. As they <laughs> 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 not so much uh, jumping around then <laughs> no no so that, that that sort of spirit of um in, that impulsive spirit which is absolutely brilliant for kind of melodies and all that kind of thing yeah. um you know is, is good on the one hand but then it's difficult as i i would say for others around you yeah um, no, to plan <laughs> were you were you surprised that rhythm stick was such a big hit because it was well, a massive hit you yeah. know, you know, it, it, we, we got the feeling that, yeah. you know, he enjoyed the blockheads had gone off the boil a little bit and then suddenly bang and you've got this number one single and it's an international mm. success. And you, when you see it played live, it, the whole room just comes alive, doesn't it? Know. You know, know. everybody's it's, it's on phenomenal. it. <laughs> I mean, what a, I'm so lucky to, you know, to be in that band because, you know, it's, it's always, to be honest, the audience really seem to identify with that music and yeah um yeah well come to, to answer your question um we were on a roll at that point it was 78 we were playing end of 78 we were playing a lot of universities um we were very popular at that point yeah and um i don't know if you know about the the history of how it came about rhythm stick but um so um the first track of um, New Boots and Panties mm. was a song called Wake Up and Make Love. Yeah, I love and right, song. thank you. And yeah. right towards the end, I go, there's a, Ian sings his last wake up. And I go, and, and I improvised that in the studio. I went, but on the piano. Yeah. And um, I, so, now we are so that was so about a year after that that we recorded wake up yeah i was down Ian had rented a house in rolvenden and i went down there and uh, we were jamming he had some you know a drum machine and a drum kit set up in his living room and um and a fender Rhodes electric piano yeah and he was playing a rhythm just a simple da, mm, da, da, mm. he liked it pretty earthy and simple yeah and I just started jamming a little ding a 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 ding just kind of like getting the groove with him. Yeah, yeah. And nothing more. I thought nothing more of it really. But then that night I went home, and then I think it was probably the following morning. I was thinking about wake up, and I was thinking, why do I like that piano riff I play on the end of it? What is it that really? Why do I like it? And when I listened to it closely, I heard. I come into it, as I go into it, I go, bah, 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 bah. and I thought, hey, what about if I take that bah, that little first, bah, and I put it with the riff I'd been playing within, I'll get, bah, bah, digga, 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 wow. bah, bah, digga, digga. and it was like a eureka moment. And yeah. I went, wow. So then I called Ian up and I said, Ian, you've got to hear this. He said, oh, yeah, well, come on, come down. I go down there to his house in, in Rolvenden. Yeah. And, um, and by this point, it was only a few days later since I'd been there, but he'd moved the piano to the garage, which was really cold. I remember that. Mm. And he gave me, a, he, he'd written a lyric, you know, three verses, the most succinct thing I'd ever seen. Yeah. And, and choruses. And um, he said, I'll see you, I'll see you later. I'm going back in the house. Yeah. So I put the lyric on the piano and I just added a few bits and pieces to my, you know, in addition to the riff I'd taken down there. Yeah. And, uh, went back in the house or in came to the garage and I said, it's done. You know, you, you know, the song is there. And he said, Oh, well, let's invite the blockheads down. Yeah. They came down. Uh, we rehearsed it. And then a, a few days later, um, Ian booked time at the workhouse studio, which is where we'd recorded um, new boots and panties. Yeah. 
mm. of that album. And um, after we recorded it, we'd done about, I think about nine takes of it. I think that we chose take two was the one that was used for the, for, you know, that yeah. he then did his vocal on. Yeah. And little details. What do I remember? Well, in the studio, it was just me and the, the engineer, Laurie Latham, in the control room. And Ian was in the studio. And he's just going, hit me, you know, like right on the beat. And I said, yeah. Ian, imagine somebody just hit you. You wouldn't just wait for the beat and go, hit me. I said, you go, hit me, you know, <laughs> yeah. hit me, you know. Yeah. So he, it out. yeah, or just like as if, so, oh, you know, like yeah. you catch somebody off guard. And he followed that through. And then, but... What I remember on the playback, I was so excited by it. I called my mum up. I said, listen, mum, I said, we've just recorded our first number one. It was oh, so, wow. ex- <laughs> it was just like, the groove was so hot. Yeah. Everything was right. As I said, you know, um, we, we built up a great uh, momentum, having played a lot of universities. Yeah. Um, and um, and it, it was that. It was just the right time, right place, right time, right song. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, 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 it's, and it I, works I, so yeah. So I did think you're right. I I did actually think this song is it, it could you know is a number one. I took you know, is yeah. one. And, and I love the the saxophone solo on it and the the twin saxes that Dave Lewis has been oh. sort of doing so well. You know, with the with the gig that I saw, he's he really, he's really yeah. sort of taking it on, hasn't he? Um, yeah. Um, oh my gosh, who, who who's the um the jazz musician? Oh my god, I, I'm so um. Art Blakey. Or... No, who played three saxes at once? You know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh my god! You know there'll be letters to you saying yes. How you, forget, <laughs> you know notes of content. Nigel, you don't know your jazz, mate. <laughs> oh my god! It'll come to me by the end of the interview. Hopefully, yeah. it'll come back. Yeah. Um, I was to say all that comment, but it wasn't. It was um. Oh my god. Oh, it'll come back. But anyway, so Ian's yeah. love of jazz kind of um, infused and that all there because that yeah. was a reference to kind of, you know, to the person. Um, it, it begins with R. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it'll come to me. But anyway, look it up. <laughs> him, him who plays many saxes was a reference. Um, right. I've seen Pharaoh Sanders play this. Like Roland Kirk. Know. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Roland yeah, yeah, Kirk. Yeah. Thank God for yeah. that. Roland yeah. Kirk. Yeah. It's not all over yet. Right. <laughs> is that is that the the track? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not. No, no. no, but I'm saying for me, it's not all over yet. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> but Roland Roland Kirk was the inspiration there. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, he he did it really well, and it it just takes you off in another direction, doesn't it? It's sublime the way it just powers off into the twi- the twin sax moment. You know. It's yeah. Inspired, really. That it that, it, that it's, it is inspired. I mean, and to yeah. this day, I mean, it's quite actually. You can't do a lot with it. You can, mm. you know, it's quite difficult. It is what it is, isn't it? It, it is the what track it is. Plays it itself. fantastic. Yeah. And the poor old sax players to always sort of like, you know, you know, remember to bring another sax as if one sax is not enough. <laughs> not enough. You know, hold another not one. Enough. And it only comes out that little bit. And then they're always nervous. They're going to put it down and someone's going to tread on it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever and pinch I'm... yourself and go, my God, did I write that? You know, there must be that feeling of like, oh, I've caught some lightning in a in a bucket here this is this is yeah. the moment yeah it does fizz it fizzes it's like yeah you're absolutely right and over the years you know you know solos have been added and you know little bits have been extended now there's a drum solo in it and you know yes yes i think yeah, they did a bass solo in the middle of it didn't they yeah and is an opportunity to introduce the band yeah um no, it feels fantastic, fantastic. And the great thing is, Nigel, the older you get, the bigger your catalogue gets. So, yes. um, <laughs> you know. Fabulous. <laughs> but, but the downside is that you, you know, like even Paul McCartney must have this issue, is that the, the audience want to hear the hits. They don't yeah. want to hear what you've just written, you know, yeah. like last year. Yeah. And as a writer, yeah. that's what... I do, you know, I mean, I, even today I'm, I, I've been writing in my, in my garden studio, I, you know, I'm sort of, Lovely. I'm working with a, I've just started working with a, a duduk player and you oh. might well ask, what is a duduk? It well, sounds I like an African instrument. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, I think it's a Middle Eastern kind of, it's like the, their version of a clarinet or oh, I see. Yeah. It's got a very haunting, mellow sort of sound. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dave Lewis introduced me to a musician um, in, in Edinburgh when we played there recently. Yeah. And uh, I found out pretty quickly this guy played a doo-doo. Well, I'm, I'm all up. I'm so up for playing with some, somebody. 
who, yeah. who plays an instrument I've never played with before. Yeah. Um, and um, I think just briefly, one reason I like playing with instruments that have sustain because um, it's because the uh, piano and guitar um, are quite sort of, well, with a guitar, you can use a lot of pedals and you can, you know, but the natural guitar plays a note and it dies quite quick. The piano, mm -hmm. you play a note and it dies fairly quickly. They're percussive mm -hmm. instruments, but the, the violin and the cello and, and even a horn, they have much longer notes, you know, like, yeah. and that for me, that's more akin to the, the human voice. Yeah. And I love it for that reason. And I, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but I'm also making an album with um, a cellist and that's what comes across to me. And I, and, and I did mention that I love romantic classical music. Yes. And, and that's because I think when you hear a violin played, it, you know, it's just like, it just somehow moves you. Yeah, it can make you cry. Yeah, for it can sure. Make you cry, you know. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Um, so why, what is that? I don't know quite what it is other than it has more length and more yeah. breath to it. Yeah. Well, you know, in, well, it just has, um, maybe it follows the long lines of, of, of the countryside or, you know, the landscape. There's yeah. something very graceful about it. Yes. Not to say guitar and piano, because obviously they have their own their own merits. Yeah. But I think that's why I'm attracted to instruments that play long notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more emotion in them, I, I guess. That's possibly. The, yeah. That, that's the thing. And um, should we just talk a little bit about the new album then? Because you've got a brand new album coming out on twenty uh, first of May, I believe, called Flow. Yeah. Um, and it's been on rotation here. So I've been really? listening. So I've been listening to you. You sent it to me, so I've been listening to it quite a lot. And I'm, I'm yeah. hearing, I'm hearing Saint Germain in there. I'm hearing. Wow. Are, are you aware of an album called Go by Stommy Yamashita and um, Mike Shreve? No, but I'm going to make a note. I'm going to send it to you because. Oh, okay. It's got Stevie Winwood singing on it, um, oh. and it's from about 19. 78 or 79 and i thought oh my god that track sounds like that really that is amazing yeah 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 wow. i'm like wow that you know uh, wow. track called i can't remember um as far as i can see and i'm thinking oh that reminds me of go that's oh fantastic. my god big funky sort of yeah. bass line and losing yeah. itself a little bit you know so yeah. just tell us because mm. th there's a thread isn't there from rhythm stick to this album because <laughs> It, th there is that sort of funk groove in there. You've got yeah. guest vocalists on there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how the album came about and the inspiration for it. Well, it's very relaxed I'm, album. It's I, I'm a you know quite I suppose prolific or you know I I I treat it like a um, as a profession. I.e. I I go to work um, five days a week mm. and. Um, my wife's very, you know, I'm very grateful to my wife because she does a lot of kind of the, you know, like um, the business side of trying to, trying to, you know, keep a household together. She, you know, so she allows me to, to play. Yes. To express. And, yourself. Um, yeah. you know, with my, in my world, really every now and again, quite rarely you, you, you get a hit, but you have to put the time in. Right. And yeah. a lot of the time, you know, I'm just making up ideas and every now and again, something you get a little, yeah. you know you get and the, oh oh i've made some money from that one <laughs> meanwhile you go on and on and on and and yeah. it, it, because you enjoy doing it it's not an issue yeah but um um i it's very intuitive um the way i write i think the album is a collection of um i would say songs over the last two years um I, I picked out, I know you mentioned there's a couple of other singers on there. Well, there are. Yeah, there's, you know, Melody there's, and um, yeah, there's a guy Melody on there. Palmer and Andy Kane. Andy yes. Kane's one of the top session singers in England. Yeah, and I looked him up. I checked him out. He's got a lovely voice. Yeah. He's got a beautiful voice. Yeah. And he, he, he does a lot of his own work. He, he does a, he's got a band that covers Steely Dan as well, which you're oh, really? But he does it so well. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and whenever he plays at a pub down my road, it's packed. <laughs> you know, he, he's very popular. Lovely guy to work with, Andy. That was we hadn't really worked that much together, and but that song was so good that I thought that should go on the album. Melody, yeah. um, we haven't worked that much together either. In fact, that song I I realised was recorded in two thousand and twelve. Oh wow! And yeah, and um, but 
I found it on my computer and I thought, oh my God, that's so good. Yeah. You know, uh, meet me in the middle. And, um, and yeah, he's like one of those, one of those rare times you come across somebody and he's just got it running right through every cell of his body, this yeah. kind of soul. And uh, I love the lyric on it. I think it did really well. So that had to go on the album. Yeah. And to but be it's honest, it's got a timeless quality, though that type of music. You know, it's not, I think you said so. it's been recorded in 2012, but it's not like it's dated or anything like no, that. No, no, this is, this is the thing. So everything else was recorded a lot more recently than that. Yeah, and um, you know, the the the, the last song I wrote was uh, "Bodies Without a Soul." Bodies Without a Soul, and in fact, that's the first single. Yes, yes, yes. And it do was you think that's your voice on that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it sounds some... great. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I mean, and then that's Cherry. Cherry Cameron is singing, uh, you know, she's singing kind of BVs on that. Yeah. Um, and she's singing on some of the, some, a couple of the other songs as well. Um, but when I recorded that song, that was the first time I thought, you know what, I could go out and perform this stuff live. I, w I would, you know, I could sit. Before that, I wasn't sure. But yeah. suddenly I thought, wow, I could go out. I could do songs like Glad to Know You, I Know Karina. Yeah. In back, going back to 2011, I did a gig at the Jazz Cafe and I um, I wanted to prove to myself I could do it. And I, I <laughs> it wasn't financially, it wasn't successful. I lost about 17, 1800 quid. However, <laughs> however, <laughs> um, you know, that's what happens if you put a 14 piece band together and you, and you were <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. But um, one of the things I did do was I did, um, I performed Reasons to be Cheerful, but I, Johnny's guitar solo, I had transcribed for horns. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that was amazing. That yeah. was fantastic to hear Johnny. You've got to get down Ronnie Scott's with that one, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounded so good. And then uh, Derek got up and I think we did Hit Me With The Rhythm Stick oh, and, wow. and, and he sang on that. So um, listen, I mean, um, yeah, it's the same elements in a way I took to, to Ian, you know, like I was, mm. you know, but it's nice to have something outside of the blockheads because um, yeah. the blockheads, you know, in a way I would say has a much more English quality to it in yeah. a way it's quite yeah. sort of localized in that respect well i say music hall because obviously the music first hall. album and i know you didn't write um uh, mm. billa ricky dicky but billa ricky dicky is well, I, very... I, I did actually i mean I oh, did you well yeah i apologize because I, I wrote the kind of descending chord sequence in it ah, right. and um but right. i didn't you know like it was already no it, it was it was what a waste i didn't write although i played yeah. hammond on it oh <laughs> did you yeah, yeah. That's my but I look at Billa Ricky well, Dicky and it could have been, you know, Mary Lloyd, you know, 1895, <laughs> 1910 or whatever. It's proper music hall, isn't it? It's it is. I tell, you what, I tell you what, it is. I don't know. I think there's a bit of um, the Cockney lad in, in the Scots, in the yeah. Irish. Yeah. They love that kind of, you know, oi, oi, yeah. all that. They, they, they love the, yeah. you know, this character that Ian painted. Yeah. Um, and they can yeah. identify with that. that sort of and um, so who would have thought you could have a song like that in the same set as Hit You With Your Rhythm Stick? I know, I know. But Ian yeah. never, never once ever said to me, Chaz, you know, aren't we playing too many genres? I never even heard him say the word genre. <laughs> I remember seeing a documentary on Ian and he carried a notebook around with him. And he filled it full of thoughts and snatched conversations and things like that. So he literally just sort of used to delve into it to come up with a, a set of lyrics. And that's, you know, it's not so much cut up like Bowie did, but he'd got these all these sort of conversations and bits that mm. could be put together. Wonderful mm. stuff. And another story about listening to, to um, New Boots and Panties the very first time. I took it round to my wife, Lorraine, who you've met. And um, yeah. we went round to her mother's and they had a drawing room and we put the record on in the drawing room and it had a speaker going through into the kitchen and she was dancing along to it, Lorraine's mother. She said, oh, this is really nice, isn't it? And then it goes, our souls, bastards, fucking cats. Yeah. <laughs> her face just went white and the record really? came up. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's a defining moment in, it, in a lot it? of people's lives. <laughs> there was always that slight sort of as long as it was comedic and it wasn't smutty, he exactly. Was, you yeah. know, that was definitely the um, yeah, the that's right. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, he wrote a fantastic lyric for me as well called Glad, you know, Glad to Know You. Do you know oh, the right. song? Yeah, for, for, that was a hit, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a huge uh, American club hit. Yes. In the yes. US. And, you know, I mean, that, was a th that was a funny thing, you know, coming on to, I don't know why I'm talking about me, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I had a different kind of um, career going for me in America. Not was career, but a kind of different um, identity in the yeah. States because the block, Ian and the Blocks never really, though they did one tour supporting Lou Reed. But it was too British, Chaz, you know? It's like Oasis not making it in America. It's mm. kind of too much of an English sound, isn't it? It was very English. You're yeah. absolutely right, you know. Um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, but... Uh, but you weren't constrained by those because you had the kind of funky disco groovy type stuff yeah, I suppose which is like an international sound yeah but it was i was very lucky because ian wrote this killer lyric for it and, yeah. and it, you know i didn't really understand it for a couple of years i was happy singing glad to know you and you're very well but you you wandered in upon my life and haven't lost me yet oh. so the turkey to the carving knife what you give is what you get a fresh and lovely summer's day we thought would never end Said the pike upon the angler's line. I, I thought you were my friend, <laughs> and and it's all about that. It's all about stab backstabbing. Yeah, and I didn't realise it. I'm saying glad to know you. And yeah, so you're taking it all. Yeah, we had been writing this whole thing with, with, with this ironic twist about yeah. you know, glad to know you, and you're very welcome. Pleased to meet you. You know, but yeah. Yeah, the irony um, that was woven through. The irony, and that's yeah. woven into so many of Ian's in lyrics. And so clever. You know, so even though I had this massive club hit, I'm sure people, is that if they listen to the lyric and work it out, they're going to go, oh, oh, there's a, there's a twist here, it's you know. Deeper. It's deeper. Hey, man, have a nice day. It's, yeah. it's, it's um, There's something deeper there. Yeah. And that's Ian. He was, it was deep. It was multidimensional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were talking about flow um mm. and mm. i mentioned a band called saint germain are you aware of saint germain i am so, an album i am in 2000 and it goes gotta get it gotta it, gotta get it get it and it's like jazz funk yeah. fusion. i was on holiday in portugal and they were playing it on the beach and you talked yeah. about being the outdoors with the sunshine and the long notes and the chill yeah you get and what was the song influence. what was the song you're talking about there I can't remember, but the album's called the album is by a band called Saint Germain. Oh, I know Saint Germain. And it's called Tourist. Yeah, the album Tourist, Tourist. Yeah, came out in two thousand. And you know, when you listen to an album that you're not that familiar with for the very first time, and I'm not an aficionado of mm. funk and jazz, you know that I come from a sort of more funky yeah, background. Yeah. You kind of look for reference points, and yeah. you know, if I I would go back to say Maggot Brain, Funkadelic, which is one of my favourite albums ever, mm. where it was rock with mm. funk fused together with Eddie Hazel's amazing yeah. guitar work and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then stopped by maybe Sly and the Family yeah. Stone. And yeah. then on obviously the Go thing, which I'm familiar with, the Mike Shreve Stir Me Your Master album, which I, th I thought was wonderful at the time. But also yeah. it was kind of a rock fusion clash together type yeah. thing. So you yeah. look for reference points. And that's mm. why I, I mentioned mm. the sort of jazzy coolness of Saint Germain, mm. you know. Um, and I, I found some of that sort of being weaved through the album. Well, very... The, there well, is a very you know, chill album. The, yeah, the, the thing is with me, the moment I see my, I, I can never rip anybody off because the moment I see I'm sort of imitating somebody, I let go of it. Yeah. I really do because I don't want to know where my influences come from. Yeah. So it's, it's all about which colours, um, you know, come to the surface. Okay. Um, Maybe when I'm on my own, in my own room, I don't feel that same sort of Anglo-Saxon drive that I do when I'm around, you know, with Ian or, don't forget I was painting pictures for Ian's lyrics, yeah. you know, and, and if yeah. I'm writing my own stuff, I'll be painting with a different, you know, with different okay. colors maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's a really interesting way of putting, putting it as well, painting pictures with the lyrics. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and that's what it's always been really. Yeah. Um, but, who who knows? I mean, I do. I, I, I as I said, I love so many different kinds of music. Um, yeah, and and I love get, actually getting up and playing blockheads at the end of the set. My God, yeah. you know. I, What's your ideal gig then? Is it 
you with Melody and uh, I've forgotten his name, Andy, oh, Andy. Um, on stage playing that sort of jazzy, funky freak out and mm. head down. Or is it playing, you know, mm. hold up by the blockheads or, or yeah. Oh, more edgy well, I, no, I, I love I, I, I did say I mean, I do love all of it. Yeah. I, mean, I, I am a butterfly. <laughs> I'm a butterfly, butterfly man. You know, I, I, I've somehow touch wood, got away with it. Yeah, you know, I've yeah, got away with it. I don't know how I've done it. Yeah, I think it's because you know it's a huge amounts of writing, and as I said, every now and again, boop, oh, you get a hit. You yeah. know, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm passionate about music, and yeah. if something touches me. It can be anything. I mean. Sakamoto um, wrote some great music, you know. Um, yeah, bless you. And, and ah, you know, I mean, but then I could love, you know, like a piece by the Beach Boys, or yeah, you know, yeah. it could be, um, it, there could be something which was really rock, rocking out that I really like, you know, like yeah. it's like Stevie Winwood and all kinds of things. I, I think it's good to, to, you know, to cross reference, you know, to have, mm. well, not cross reference, to have a, a broad interest in music, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like some yeah. people always stick to the same dishes that they eat, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Familiarization. It's, it's, it's familiar. You know, so. you know what you're going to get, but I, you're back to the same curry house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least I agree with you. I agree with you. That's why I'd reference something like as, as a, you know, a, a guy that's into punk and actually modern punk. There's lots mm. of modern punk bands around uh, mm. that I'm listening to at the moment. We, obviously, we write for Louder Than War. So we're out there, you know, not looking, but it's been, we, we've been drenched in new music all the time, you know, and it's really, really I mean, important to keep your eyes and ears open. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is, like, with punk, you know, I mean, let's, you know, if you think about the lyrics, really, I mean, like for a moment, I mean, they're, they're quite, they're, they're dissatisfied, right? The lyrics, and I, in my way, I'm dissatisfied with the, the, the way the world is. Yeah, yeah. But the music I might use to paint with it is is is, no, is, is idiosyncratic. I just don't yeah. follow a form necessarily yeah. that's set in stone. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I it doesn't it, it it doesn't come ready form with me. I, I don't even know where the music comes from. It, you can You're start talking about the standard form of songwriting with verse, verse, chorus, middle age. Well, even the even the textures of it. Yes. Even the textures. I don't know yeah. what they're going to be yeah. because it all starts, you know, it could start with um, a piano riff. It could start with a bass, you know, a rhythm. Um, you know, a, so therefore, it's an experiment. The whole thing's an experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you can see that. On, you can hear that on the new album. I was, I was talking about as far as I can say, and, and it was those sort of fuzz guitars that sort of sent it off in a kind of different direction, which rang with me. You know, oh, that sounds great. That you know, I really like that. And if I was lying in the garden now, I'd be listening to your whole album all the way. Oh, through, thank you. Chilling out it's, on it. You know. I mean, you know, it, it, it yeah. It's funny because um, there's a guy who now does the merch for the blockheads and he used to be a mm. hardcore fan of the of, of, of us and him and his yeah. his, his partner who's japanese they used to stand down the front of the stage and in the garden you know when the line of, in the gardens of japan you know yeah. it comes up you know yeah. he'd raise his like, like, white flag with a you know, red center yes and, and, and very quickly put it down again <laughs> um and but he what was he he was saying that um yeah when he hears my music because i send him a lot of my music he says yeah. um you know he imagines he's on a beach somewhere yeah and yeah. for some reason and this could be going back to when i was in my in my teens when i was in my teens i went to a boarding school and i didn't like it particularly i'm mm. not sure I, I, maybe other people did but the thing was it was a prison in as much as yeah. i was only allowed out X amount of time. So what I did was I, I used music as a as an escape route. I could go wherever I wanted in my head, yeah. you know. And um and I think I've been in a way been using music in a lot of ways as a form of transport all my life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's cathartic. And so there yeah. is this degree yeah. of me, you know, um, escaping. And I think often when we think about escape, we think of beaches because. Yeah. And the sea, because that's the time when we let go of our day to day concerns and routines. <clears throat> yeah. <sighs> we breathe out and relax and relax. Yeah. You know, yeah. all those 
hard edges are gone, you know, they're not there. And, yeah. and then you, and you suddenly think, when was the last time I felt like this? Oh, it was the last time I was in, I was in Mallorca, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lying <laughs> on the beach. Sun, oh, sun yeah. Bearing down. Bearing down. Well, lovely. One thing I've started to realise, you you know, as I get older and, um, you know, people like um, Eckhart Tolle um, and other great healers have, have made this very clear to me, which is yeah. underneath the breath, you know, like our thoughts, our heads, you know, there's a much, there's, there's a kind of calm underbelly if you mm. want to use that word you know like kind of where with that and that's there all the time a lot of yeah. people they, they meditate um those who meditate they'll they'll go into you know deep state for 20 minutes in the morning and maybe 20 minutes at night and then after that right right okay yeah. it's back to work as usual but really yeah. what they're saying and you know the heal it great teachers are saying that's there all the time get rid of anxiety anguish yeah and it's there all the time and they're so right yeah. We, we, you know, and I, and learning that and, and trying to adopt that means that you can be in that playful, peaceful state always. Yeah. It's just remembering that because it's so easy otherwise to get, you know, caught up in the. I, I think you're right. And I think that those that write in a write music, appreciate music, are mm. far more attuned to that, far more tuned into that than those that don't because they have that connection that ability to to release a little bit don't they to lose themselves in the music yeah and look how really. passionate you are and you know you're so happy always, and lovely. <laughs> like, <"Hello?" laughs> always have a back. smile on my face when i'm interviewing people I enjoy, right? I enjoy because i don't interview i just chat so it's nice <laughs> it's so nice yeah. but that's you know when you think about it you're doing something which is all about the spirit it's all about spirit and we're yeah. very lucky because how many people you know what percentage of the public can actually do that? That's true. No, that's absolutely true. That's you know, wonderful. just think about Ian for a moment. He said he doesn't write music for other musicians, you know, because, yeah. you know, musicians yeah. don't generally talk to musicians about chords, you yes. know, and, and, and tapos. And yeah. Ian yeah. Saw, saw life as being <laughs> a lot broader than that. <laughs> well, um, it's been wonderful talking to you. Just um, a couple of quick fire questions, if you don't mind. Um, mm. Was Reasons to be Cheerful the first rap record? Ooh. <laughs> um, well, a lot of people think it was. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, is it the Art House of, of uh, Art Ensemble of Chicago or there's something with a name like that? I think they were putting words to kind of funky, jazzy. Sugar things. Hill, I mean, is obviously. Well, there. then there was Sugar Hill, but I yeah. think that came after. Did that come after I Reasons to be I think so, 78, 79. Okay. Well, no. Well, Almost. Very close okay. together, wasn't it? Um, well, let's say yes, it was then. In England, <laughs> in England, in the UK, I would say yes. It probably was, because Rapture came came after, didn't it? Um, yeah. Blondie. Rapture, oh yeah. yeah. Blondie, Ooh. yeah, she did a little bit of a rap on that, didn't she? But I think it, it was. Um, it and just ones for fans of the Blockheads, because it's obviously off, I read quite a lot. There's, an, um, there's a great deep love for Norman. And everybody's yeah. saying, oh, where's Norman? Where's Norman? Is Norman where's Norman coming back? Is there any chance that Norman's going to pop in and say hello? Mate? Well, you have to ask Norman. Oh, right, really, okay. No, <laughs> the thing is, um, I think he felt depressed when Derek passed. You know, I think he thought it was an end, end of an era, really. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you can and understand I, that. And, uh, yeah, and I, he's right. That era was over, but what happened was the blockheads needed to work yeah they you know and we had we had lockdown nothing was happening then yeah. yeah and um i think he's a bit pissed off with us because we didn't consult him but we did mickey tried mickey gallagher who runs the band yeah tried to get in touch with norman and he was making it quite difficult like you know once i wasn't answering his phone he would never wanted to do anything this mm. is whilst Derek was very ill oh right so right. i think the feeling was okay well norman look if you want to come back come back in your own time yeah no one's going to push you the yeah. band needs to keep working and um you know i've got massive respect for, for norman and love yeah. for him yeah. and um you know his presence on stage is is, is massive yeah. um with his hands um you know hand magic is that right is that right, <laughs> yeah, right. right. slight of hand Slice of, of hand. Slice of hand. 
Yeah, yes, no, that's... I saw it. He was supporting Wilco before he passed away, bless his soul. But uh, there you go. That was quite... Well, that, uh... that was it. That's, see, this is the other thing. You know, he, for the last few years, that was his band. As much as the Blockers yeah. was, he was playing with Wilco. Yeah. Um, and um, obviously he's been hit by that as well. Wilco passed and now Derek's passed. Yeah. But he hasn't called us up and said, hey, guys, you know, what's happening? You know, are there any gigs? He hasn't yeah. done that yet. But I saw him, he was at an awards ceremony last week or the week before. Yeah. Vive La Rock. I just saw some photos. So last yeah. time. Yeah. I don't yeah. know whether he played or whether he was just there as a, I don't know. But I just I saw some photos. Do you know what? I think he's making another album, his own album. Oh, really? You tell, tell me that, so, you know, he's talking about doing that. Yeah. How was the Stroud gig the other night? You played Stroud, didn't you? Stroud was amazing. Was it? Um, yeah, the subscription rooms, uh, the sub uh, the hall, sorry. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That is a fantastic place. Yeah. Um, um, Keith Allen turned up, who I didn't recognize. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know who I am. Came up on stage. Huh? Did you get no, him no, up on stage? No, no, he just popped into the dressing room and goes, hello, oh, Chaz. And I go, hello. And, and, and there was only, he said, you don't know who I am, do you? But he has <laughs> changed. He's got a beard and stuff. You know, he doesn't yeah. look quite like he'd. The Keith Allen, I probably remember. filled out a bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, but the gig was fantastic. Oh my god, yeah, it was yeah. really good. Um, lovely, lovely, warm crowd. I mean, that's just it's a nice part of the world, isn't it? Up there, I mean, yeah. the journey we took there was just stunning. I mean, it was a lovely sunny day, and you know, you rolling hills and valleys and. You know, great. You put your album on and just lose yourself in the drive with the sun beating. Oh my god! It, you know, it was it was fantastic. It was it was so nice. You know, super. I, I love that side of England. You know, you, yeah, you get away yeah. from because where we live and where I'm sitting right now, we're on the the edges of London, and it's like a little kind of oh, it, it looks like a Dorset village here. You know, like yeah. it's all kind of it's very quite rural. But yeah. then just down the road, you've got the hum, you know, the... the, the yeah, business, yeah, you know. we're the same. We're, we're just outside in South Manchester. And of course, you've got the, the humdrum just over there. So you know, you, you've got your own little kind of... Yeah, we've got our own little oasis here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Look, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you, Charles. You're an absolute yes. gentleman. I loved the, I loved the new album. I've been listening Thank to you, it. It's not, nor, it's not the normal thing that I listen to. But of course, you pick oh. up, as I said reference points and diversions yeah. from you know what you consider to be your bag the new album is called flow it comes out on may the 21st and preceding that is the single bodies without soul that's coming out on may the 5th the album's coming out on may the 19th isn't it not may the 21st yeah yeah, yeah. um so thank you so much for um, thank you nigel being interviewed by me or agreeing to be interviewed oh man by it's me. been brilliant it's been i've enjoyed brilliant. it immensely thank you so much no i'm so excited i actually got zoom to work this time <laughs> Oh, <laughs>